Hey, up, it's Steve from the old Yorkshire geek, and it's got a list, a, li- a Star Trek list for us to look out, um, look at. But this time, it's from the actual Star Trek uh, website. So this is about. Um, it's called What the Helm Star Trek's Astonishing View Screen Reveals, which I thought were interesting. So let's have a look at this, shall we? But before we start, don't forget, like and subscribe, share the videos, drop a comment, hit the notification bell if you subscribed already. If you become a member, you'll see this uh, early, uh, you know, than the, the regular plebs out there. Um, also go to Patreon, same deal there. Uh, and all that jazz. Uh, go buy some merch from the merch store. I haven't got a merch T-shirt on. I've got a mer- well, this isn't a merch cap. This is a homemade toy G cap. But you can get caps with the the logo on and stuff. Right. So here we go. There it is. Uh, there you go from the Star Trek website. Links in the description, by the way. Uh, what the helm? Star Trek's astonishing view screen reveals. Star Trek Starfleet's Federation vessels have been greeted with a number of wild scenarios on their various missions in space. By the way, I haven't read the whole article, but I've skimmed down and looked at the pictures. Some of them are view screens. Because there's like from Discovery and stuff. That's got a window, hasn't it? A bridge window. I hate bridge windows. Anyway, Jay Stoby wrote this. Uh, and there's a a stylized image. Right, Starfleet officers who operate the helm are celebrated for their piloting skills, fearless resolve, and the ability, Oxford comma there, and ability to handle any out of this world phenomenon they may encounter. As well trained as these crew members are, the unpredictable nature of their occupation uh, still has a way uh, of presenting them uh, with surprising sights that boggle the mind and put their starships to the test. Let's take a journey through Star Trek history and examine some of the wildest situations that Federation vessels have flown into while on their missions of discovery. So first up, an unfamiliar face in where silence has lease. But I think it is a familiar face. I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure. The voice is familiar. But uh, this is uh, Nagilum, or is it Nagilum? I can't remember how it's pronounced from the episode. Uh, I, I find this one of the scariest episodes of Next Generation uh, because it is quite brutal and in a scientific way. Um, but there they are, the, the, the Enterprise. It'll tell us what. Let's read. Where Silence has lease, right. If your day started by stumbling across a near perfect replica of your sister ship in an unexplored region of deep space, you might assume um, that was about the. the you might assume that was about as weird as things would get on that mission. In Starfleet, you'd likely be wrong. Uh, the USS Enterprise D found itself... Go away, that keeps popping up, that. I don't know about Harry Mudd, go away. <laughs> the USS Enterprise... It'll probably pop up again in a bit. The USS Enterprise D found itself in such a quandary with Captain Picard realising that someone was testing his vessel's responses to various stimuli. Suddenly... Uh, A rough proximity of a a humanoid face appeared on the view screen, calling itself Nagilum, or Nagilum, as I said, I can't remember how it's pronounced, and probing the crew with scientific inquiries uh, about their bodies and mortal existences. Uh, Haskell, the officer who was navigating the ship at the time, sadly became the focus for Nagilum's, Nagilum's, I should have checked, uh, interest in death. The life form directed its powerful capabilities at Haskell, inflicting him with a painful death. So there we go. And it did think, did threaten that, uh, kind of threaten. No, I just said it matter-of-factly that, you know, half of the crew or whatever uh, could die. But, you know, it's, it's an experiment that he's willing, um, you know, to, to do. Because, essentially, it is the version of um, a modern-day scientist in our time. Uh, you know, experimenting on animals and stuff like that, and basically seeing the the human crew or the Federation crew as lab rats, didn't care, had scientific, you know, detachment, didn't care if they lived or died. Uh, and it's Earl Bowen who does, does the voice, uh, who you may know from Terminator, uh, and Terminator 2 and Terminator 3 as well, uh, played Dr. Silberman uh, in that, and... How I remembered his name, I have no idea. You know what I'm like with names, but it just popped in my head. Uh, but I don't know if it's, it's I don't know if it's his face that's been you know changed about. I don't know, but it's Earl Bowen's voice, and I, I do. I find that I really like 
this episode. Uh, I can't remember what season it's from. See the season one or two. It's two. Season two. Because Riker's got a beard. By Riker's beard. Anyway, it is a really good episode. It's one of my favourites. Um, where Silence has lease. Uh, and I think it's terrifying at times. Uh, there's a... Come across a... Is it a Romulan warbird? Something like that. And the... Um, um, the Yamato... Um, which I think has a different registry to what we see when we see it again, <laughs> I think. Anyway, so there we go. So what's up next? The Aftermath of Wolf 359 in the Best of Both Worlds, Part 2. Ooh, a bit inside of my cheek again. So there we go. Here we see in the, the wreckage and the supposed to be... I don't know if it shows it in this. Maybe it's that one, I don't know. The supposed to be a Discovery-style ship, you know. But it's not, you know. These were obviously made... Years before Star Trek Discovery were even thought of, it were based on the, the design from Star Trek Phase 2 that might have been the Enterprise. Like the pizza cutter, and uh, it's supposed to be in here somewhere. Maybe it's that one, or maybe it's that one, I don't know. Anyway, see what it says. Best of Both Worlds Part 2. Told you this a pop-up again. Go away, Harry Mudd. With Captain Picard having been assimilated by the Borg, uh, or partially, no, he wasn't fully assimilated, was he? William T. Riker assumed command of the Enterprise D and directed the ship to rendezvous. I mean, he was in, the Borg were in control of him, essentially, weren't he? You know, he was Borg. He was Locutus of Borg. But anyway, whatever. But he wasn't like a drone, was he? Uh, anyway, uh, and directed the ship to rendezvous with Starfleet at Wolf 359. Wesley Crusher notified Riker that they were approaching the system where dozens of starships had gathered to intercept the Borg cube on its route to Earth. I think there were 39 ships. Altogether, uh, and something like eleven thousand crew uh, died, but not all of them. Not all of the, all of them died at Wolf Three Five Nine. Uh, you know, there were some that escaped in the escape pod, such as Cisco uh, and 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 his son um, uh, Jake. Ben Cisco and his son Jake were on the Saratoga. Um, they escaped uh, before it was destroyed, uh, and also I forgot his name. <laughs> The captain of the Titan from Picard Season 3, who I wasn't a big fan of. Uh, everybody loved him, except me. Uh, he escaped as well, didn't he? Anyway, uh, the powerful fleet was expected to prevent the cube from proceeding deeper into Federation space. It can't be that much deeper. I mean, Wolf 359, I think, is quite close to Earth. You know, Sol, the Sol system, so it can't get much deeper. Anyway. Uh, but the Borg had superior technology and the advantage of Picard's knowledge pertaining to Starfleet protocols and capabilities. Ensign Crusher manoeuvred the Enterprise D into position, but Riker's orders to put the scene uh, on screen revealed a sea of burning wreckage drifting through space. Uh, the battle had been more akin to a massacre, and although such sights became more common during the Dominion War, Starfleet's losses at Wolf 359 were a shockingly devastating sight to behold. Uh, yes, they're also the ship that um, Riker was given, it was offered to, you know, as captain, the Melbourne. Um, that were in there as well, which we, I think we saw get destroyed in the pilot episode of Deep Space Nine. I think we saw the Melbourne get destroyed there, I think. I think it was, um, I can't remember now. It might have been like, I don't know. I can't remember what class it was now. It was either an Excelsior class or a Nebula or a Ambassador class. I can't remember which one. Or it might have been a totally different one. I can't remember. Anyway. But anywho, moving on. They also mentioned the Kyushu and others, others as well. But there were 39 ships. Right, next up. The Fall of Praxis in Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country. So we're in the movies now. Here we are aboard the... Speaking of the Excelsior, aboard the USS Excelsior. NCC 2000... Now on this, uh, not NX2000 as we saw it in Star Trek 3. Uh, and there's Sulu and there's Praxis and... What are we looking at there? <laughs> Go away, Harry Mudd. It's, it's kind of confused me as this. As the moon... Is that all that's left of it there? Or have we just seen part of it? Is the rest of it there? And there's just this bit lit up. I don't, I don't know exactly what we're seeing, but anyway. Maybe it'll tell us. Typically... The person flying the ship himself in these situations, uh, Captain Hikaru Sulu, experienced this unfortunate incident from the USS Excelsior's captain's chair, while his helm officer, Le Jure, um, 
don't ask me the names <laughs> of the Excelsior crew. Even though we, you know, we um, we met a lot of them, didn't we, in the Voyager episode uh, flashback? Anyway, handled the controls. The vessel was rocked by an intense subspace shockwave. By the way, we didn't see uh, Tuvok for some reason in Star Trek VI. I wonder why. Uh, the vessel was rocked by an intense subspace shockwave, tracking the phenomenon back to the coordinates of Praxis, home to the Klingon's key energy production facility. When able to confirm the existence of Praxis, the location is brought up on screen and magnified, revealing that the vast majority of the moon had been blasted away in the explosion. So little of Praxis remained intact that the Excelsior's view screen needed to highlight where the rest of its form would have been. All right, so that's these all that's left of it. So it, really, in, in theory, um, we should next time we see Kronos, or when we see Kronos in TNG era, it should have had a ring, shouldn't it? You know, the remains of Praxis uh, forming a ring around the the the, the planet. But we don't. Cause obviously, did think of that. But uh, yeah, that were a cool scene. That were a cool scene. Like I say, it kind of confused me. So it was pretty much destroyed them, wasn't it? Through overmining, apparently. I think something else was going on there, wasn't it? A bit of a weapons test. I bet they got the um, information about the Zindi super weapon. I bet they found that somewhere and they were testing it on Praxis and it went awry. Head cannon. <laughs> right, and the simulated Earth in Star Trek First Contact, sticking with the films, we're now on the Enterprise E. And there it is, there's Earth assimilated with little, look, all lines connecting everything. The oceans have boiled away or been drunk, I don't know. Oh, excuse me. This was a cool scene, though, as they're entering into the uh, temporal vortex. Anyway. In yet another Borg incursion that targeted Earth, Captain Picard's USS Enterprise E warped into Sector 001 to salvage Starfleet's chances of stopping the cube. Yes, because at the beginning of uh, <laughs> First Contact, it says, um, Now the Borg have begun an invasion of the Federation, and this time... No one can stop them. Then he goes, how many cubes? One. <laughs> Voyager encountered like 15 bog, uh, cubes at once, didn't it, and, uh, in Scorpion? But anyway, whatever. Excuse me. Go away, Harry Mudd. Though the task force had been decimated, enough ships remained to follow Picard's instructions and join together in a strike which vanquished the Borg vessel. It is a cool scene. It is a cool battle scene, is that? Uh, the Battle of Sector 001. It is really, really good. Uh, you see the Millennium Falcon in it briefly. <laughs> um, the, a single Borg sphere escaped the explosion, leading Picard to tell Lieutenant Hawk... I forgot the name of the actor. Super famous actor, I forgot his name. ...to set a pursuit course and track the enemy craft... Chronometric particles emanated from the sphere, creating a temporal vortex which caught the Enterprise E in its wake. A very different image of Earth emerged on the view screen as its altered atmosphere and mechanical surface were now home to 9 billion Borg. It kind of looks, I would imagine, the planet, the Vija planet looked. But I know that one. Some people said that were a Borg world, but I know it supposedly wasn't. Um. Realising the sphere must have travelled back in time to assimilate the planet, the Enterprise E stayed behind the Borg ship so that, so that it could reverse any changes it made to Federation history. Yes, they followed it in. Pursued course, Mr. Hawk. So they went through and uh, kind of changed history. Some people suggest, I've heard this mentioned, that because of what happened in Star Trek First Contact, which is why Enterprise kind of looks a, a bit different to what you'd expect it to, you know, the, the NX-01 and all that. Um, history was changed. I, the, time, the Star Trek timeline was changed somewhat. Um, it's an interesting thought, I suppose. But anyway. Right, next up, Federation Headquarters. Here, here we go. In Die Trying, we're on the, uh, the Discovery. As I said, it's not a view screen, it's a bridge window. But, you know, it, it has things that appear on it, you know, but... Technically, it's not a view screen. I hate them. <sighs> Still new to the 32nd century, the USS Discovery solved the puzzle of where Federation headquarters had been hidden. I thought it was Starfleet headquarters. See, I'm confused. I think they got... The, quite often in Discovery, I think they get Starfleet and the Federation mixed up. But anyway. Uh, 
With Kayla Detmer at the helm, Discovery traversed the barrier, concealing the station from the rest of the galaxy. A magnificent view greeted the crew, as Starfleet's surviving armada made up for its limited numbers with an array of astounding technology. Sensors showed their hulls were composed of an advanced mix of neutronium alloy fibres, organic materials and holographic containment walls. The sizeable ship's detached nacelles impressed Discovery's pilot. Uh, in Discovery got detached nacelles when it had a refit, uh, which they kind of forgot about. Um, but anyway, never mind. There was an episode where they were to go up the the struts, the nacelle struts on Discovery, to plant a bomb in the nacelles. Go away, Harry Mudd. It's annoying, is that? To plant bombs in the nacelles. But, but they forgot that the nacelles, nacelles were detached at the time. But never mind. <sighs> the sizable ship's detached nacelles impressed Discovery's pilot while the crew stared in awe at a vessel carrying an entire rainforest. Paired with the brilliant light of the distortion field which encompassed the outpost, these previously unfathomable technological feats painted a, painted a majestic scene. Yes, it was 32nd century technology, but they relied on a 900-year-old ship to save the day and crew. I've always said it's akin to a, a Viking longboat just appearing in the middle of you know some war games, a modern-day war games, and, you know, beating other ships around it <laughs> with their shields and swords and arrows and spears. <sighs> don't, don't get me started. Alternate Enterprises in Parallels. Uh, this is a, another good episode. I enjoy this one. It's a wharf based episode, isn't it? But there they are looking at um, um, Alternate Enterprise. Right, it's Parallels. I think it's a season six or seven. Might be season seven episode. Uh, trapped in an alternate quantum reality where the USS Enterprise D had a Cardassian helm officer. Well, there, there they are. Uh, the Prime Universe's Worf, as my mum called him, Worf, uh, worked alongside that reality's bridge crew to locate the fissure that had sent him he, him there. The quantum anomaly destabilised, prompting an infinite number of Enterprise Ds to begin appearing throughout the sector. As if a region filled with identical starships wasn't odd enough, the alternate Captain William T. Riker, who had assumed the role following his own Captain Picard's death, received a message from his vessel's prime counterpart. Only to... prime from our point of view. Obviously not from them. Uh, only to see his long dead captain on the screen, flanked by his William T. Riker, dealing with realities conver converging, had a habit of producing mind bending moments. But talk about a long day at work. Yeah, it was a good episode. They even found an Enterprise that were, ended up it was that battered by the Borg, because the Borg had invaded, they destroyed the Federation pretty much. Um, and they refused to go back. You know, we'll be destroyed, and but they, they blew up anyway. Because I think the warp field collapsed or something, the warp containment. Antimatter containment field collapsed, that was it. Anyway, so there we go. That was a good episode, I enjoyed Parallels. And followed by the Pegasus. I always remember Parallels the Pegasus. I think because that's what, when I had the VHSs, I think them two episodes were on. Anyway. Uh, a world appears in Meridian. This is Deep Space Nine. You know what? I generally skip this one <laughs> for some reason. They down the. This is the, the view screen of the Defiant. Harry Mudd's back. Go away. Uh, this is kind of it's a bit like... Um, oh, what's the name of the thing now? Um, oh, what they call that? That Scottish village that appears and disappears. <sighs> I'll put it there. Intense Meridian. Right, intense gravimetric distortions grew the, uh, drew the USS Defiant to Trialis, a star system devoid of any planets. At the con, Jadzia Dax, excuse me, detected that distortions, that the distortions were not coming from the star itself, a confusing development considering there were no planets nearby, at least until Meridian appeared. It popped in my head, <laughs> the name of that Scottish village. 
Materialising out of a, out of what seemed to be empty space, the planet settled into a stable orbit. Its inhabitants contacted the Defiant, relaying that Meridian had returned from a dimension that intersected with this galaxy. The planet had a dual existence, shifting between two dimensions and transitioning from a non-corporeal to a corporeal state. While Praxis had stoked amazement with its explosive disappearance nearly a century before, Meridian bewildered onlookers with its unexpected entrance. Yeah, I tend to skip this one, to be honest. <laughs> What's the name of that Scottish village? I'll, I will, I'll put it there. It's on the tip of my tongue. <sighs> Everybody's screaming at the screen now. It's that. Right, Apollo's hand in Who Mourns for Adonais. And there it is. Dun, 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 dun. It is from the original series. Cool. Uh, during a standard survey of Pollux 4, uh, the USS Enterprise was confronted by a very non-standard spectacle. After Hikaru Sulu brought the ship into orbit, a gigantic green hand reached out toward the starship. Scans did not identify it as living tissue or a projection, but rather a field of energy. When able to get away, uh, the Enterprise was grabbed by the hand, its engines and tractor beams proving to be ineffective in securing the vessel's release. Further analysis determined it to be equivalent to a conventional force field, but it was actually controlled by an immortal being who ancient humans referred to as Apollo. Uh, it would pop up again in um, uh, Star Trek Continues with the same actor. Good episode. The cosmic traveller could channel the energy on a whim, uh, though the logical explanation did little to erase the peculiar image of an immense hand grasping for the Enterprise's saucer. Yeah, cool. This is one of the. It is. They even show it at the end of. Is it the end of Star Trek Beyond? I think it is. They even you know show it in there. The end, end credits in the giant green hand. Yes, so they do. Um, I was going to say something else and I forgot what it was. Never mind. Anyway. Go away, Harry Mudd. Right, the Queen's last gambit in The Last Generation. This is Picard Season 3. Uh, I'm a bit confused by this, to be completely honest. See what it says. Anyway, The Last Generation. They the see the, uh, the Borg, like Mega Cube, or whatever they call it, uh, in Jupiter's atmosphere. As waves of assimilated Starfleet vessels besieged Earth... Uh, Jean-Luc Picard commanded the restored USS Enterprise D on its journey to challenge the Borg at Jupiter. Data and Geordie LaForge sat at their old posts and operated the forward stations and Picard spotted the unthinkable, a Borg cube seemingly more enormous than any they had dealt with before. Uh, was it what they call it a mega cube or super cube? I can't remember what called something like that. Was nestled into the gases of Jupiter's great red spot. William T. Riker remarked that the Borg had somehow concealed a transwarp conduit inside the planet's atmosphere. Between the cube's sheer size, the menacing manner in which the ship was obscured by the planet's gases, and the presence of the Federation's most deadly enemy in what was essentially Earth's backyard, this alarming unveil was destined to land on our list. I can't really remember what happened. What happened to um, Io? Um, what is it, Io? I'm thinking of Babylon 5. They had a station, didn't they? A space station around Jupiter, didn't they? Um, uh, what happened to that? Did it mention it? I can't remember. It's a while since I've seen Picard Season 3. But it was cool because they did a Return of the Jedi with the, the Enterprise D flying into the into the Borg cube. It was cool, I suppose. Um, anyway. Uh, I don't know about my confusion. I was confused. Is this supposed to be the, Bo the Borg Queen that we see in First Contact? It's kind of suggested that maybe it is. This is what's left of what happened, you know, to that Borg Queen. But I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't really understand it. To be completely honest, because that one, that ended up in the past, didn't it? Well, she's been there. I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I'm confused by it. It kind of, and also it kind of, I think, what it about the Borg Queen from Voy um Yeah, the finale of Voyager. I'll, I'd have to watch it again and see if it gives us any any answers. But um, I don't think it did. I think it left it vague, um, which is kind of annoying. Uh, a lot of people say, you know, Picard Season 3 with this amazing series. It was, it was okay. It was the best, easily the best of the Picard series. 
but it wasn't, ama it wasn't amazing in my opinion and, and it left too many questions unanswered but uh, which Star Trek shouldn't do not simple questions anyway it's all right to be ambiguous and you know not answer all the questions but basic stuff we need an answer for anyway eight, next up Abraham Lincoln in the Savage Curtain there he is again dun 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 there's Sulu like what the oh bye. Right, of all the mystifying anomalies and unbelievable visages, or visages, Harry, like Harry Mudd, to have popped up on Starfleet view screens witnessing one of your planet's former presidents, or country, he I mean, wasn't the president of the planet, was he? Floating in space four centuries after his death and countless light years from your home world reigns supreme. Um, he did go, you know, on board and... and and call Uhura by some, you know, racial slur. What we consider a racial slur these days. But, you know, she said, we're not bothered about that in this day and age. Um, but apparently there were by the time we get to, like, discovery, but never mind. Such was the scenario when President Abraham Lincoln coalesced before Captain James T. Kirk's USS Enterprise, insisting that, insisting that he beam aboard so that he could prove he was not an illusion. With Hikaru Sulu piloting the ship, Kirk headed down to the transporter room. Although the captain did not actually believe this was the real Lincoln, scans registered the being as human. Of course, Lincoln turned out to be one of several constructs created by the Excalbians. Uh, in an unorthodox effort to understand humanity's concept of good versus evil. Regardless of the explanation, catching a glimpse of Lincoln hovering on their view screen was surely something the Enterprise crew would never forget. Yeah, they end up going on the planet where they're to... The good guys, like Abraham Lincoln and uh, Surak, maybe somebody else, Captain Kirk, obviously, maybe so, I can't remember, had to fight, you know... Uh, villains uh, from the past, like Genghis Khan or whatever, and um, a Klingon chap. Um, K maybe Kalis, I don't know, I can't, I can't bloody remember. Can't remember. It wasn't one of the best episodes, but because of Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln being in it, it was one of the most memorable. Uh, so, oh, that's it, we're done. Right, that's it, we're done. So there we go, an interesting list of things that were viewed on the view screen you could probably think of many many more uh, more interesting um, stuff for instance the first time we see a Ferengi in uh, uh, the episode The Last Outpost the TNG episode The Last Outpost just a massive Ferengi face on the view screen with all white behind so we can't see you know exactly um, what's going on uh, what else uh, there's, been, there's been lots of others haven't there Lots and lots of others that we can think of. Put them in the comments. Your favourite view screen reveals. I'm trying to think of my favourite one now. My favourite view screen reveal. I mean, maybe when Locutus appeared um, on screen at the end of um, Best of Both Worlds, you know, episode one, when Locutus appeared as, uh, you know, Captain Picard as a Borg. That was a pretty good reveal, wasn't it? I am Locutus of Borg. And all that stuff. And Riker went, fire! And then nothing happened. <laughs> we had to wait months and months. In the UK, we had to probably wait years. Uh, but nothing happened. Anyway, so there we go. We will leave it there. So, I hope you enjoyed that list. Harry Mudd pops up again. Go away, Harry. Anyway, if you want to have a look at that, the link is in the description. And as I said earlier, don't forget, like and subscribe, share the videos, drop a comment, hit the notification bell if you subscribed already. Lots of links in the description for memberships and Patreon and merch and Facebook, X, Instagram, all that stuff. Right, so we'll leave it there. So thanks for watching, wherever you are, look after each other. And until next time, I'll see you there.